Good morning and happy Thursday. Welcome to another Future of Health Immersion Program session. My name is Laura Fritchie and I'm a project administrator uh, for the Digital Health Strategy team here at the AMA. As part of our Emerging Tech series, today we'll be hearing from three speakers working in the extended reality space. I encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box um, and if there's time, we'll surface those at the end. So feel free to ask those throughout the session today. We'll hear from three speakers, as I mentioned, um, creating the foundations of a new medical specialty, medical extended reality from Dr. Mark Singh. And then we'll hear from Frank Scully and Dr. Namjin King, practical applications and case studies in the space. And as I mentioned, if there's time, we'll have a Q&A and then we'll do a quick wrap up and close. Our three speakers today, we'll start with Dr. Mark Singh. He's the Associate Chief Medical Information Officer of Digital Innovation and the Medical Director of the Digital Innovation Hub at Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as the Associate Program Director of the Clinical Informatics and Innovation Fellowship at Mass General Brigham. We'll then hear from Frank Scully, co-founder and CEO of BioDigital Inc. And then we'll hear from Dr. Nam Jim King, Kim, um, and he is the medical director for the Einstein Surgical Network and also coordinates the Einstein International Robotic Surgery Certificate Program. Dr. Zhang, I'll kick it off to you. Thanks so much, Laura. And it really is a, a pleasure and a privilege to uh, be uh, a part of this group. Uh, I hope uh, uh, to be able to set kind of the stage and talk a little bit about kind of what we're doing to create the foundations for this what I think, and I think probably all of the speakers here uh, believe is uh, a new medical specialty, medical extended reality. So I do have a um, disclosure. Uh, I will be talking about um, in uh, great detail Amer the American Medical Extended Reality Association, uh, which is a 501c3 nonprofit medical society, which I am the founder and president of. Um, and as Laura kind of mentioned, uh, I have a background kind of in the field of clinical informatics, digital innovation, uh, and also clinically, I'm an a internist and also palliative care physician. I still see patients, um, uh, uh, I still see patients, uh, but most of my time is in kind of this space of informatics. And um, uh, th over the last couple of years, I've really gotten very deep into the field of extended reality in healthcare to the point where, as I mentioned earlier, I uh, founded and now am the president of the American Medical Extended Reality Association. So um, I wanna start by just kind of talking about kind of where I came from. So like probably many of you who are seeing this, you may uh, just have heard about the field of XR and the implications in medicine and, um, and, and really are trying to learn more. And that was kind of my case about two, two and a half years ago uh, where this is my team, the Brigham Digital Innovation Hub. Um, and we learned uh, about kind of XR together through kind of one of the core functions that we, we do. So at the iHub, which really is the center for digital innovation at Brigham and Women's, we do kind of four major functions. The first is we create kind of solutions for the organization, software solutions, pilot um, uh, digital products. We also function as advisors for Brigham staff, whether they're residents, they're clinicians, um, researchers who are thinking about doing something in digital health. We also function as a hub for external companies, whether they're startups uh, or large organizations who want to engage with the Brigham in some way. And the reason why I got into extended reality was um, about two and a half years ago, we took on a new role, which was really to become a centralized subject matter expert for emerging technologies. And it, when we were asked to kind of do this, we um, needed to think about, well, what would be, how do we do that? How do we become a SME for emerging technologies, uh, particularly when maybe we don't have any, any kind of inbound or internal kind of um, subject matter interest or, or, or expertise already? So as we started thinking about this, we picked extended reality as kind of our index case. And what we did was we looked kind of across the industry, we looked internally um, uh, at, at what was happening uh, at National Brigham, and it was pretty amazing. The, the initiative we, we, we kind of created was this thing called Next Up, Extended Reality. And really, um, the purpose of Next Up was really to be able to build up 
that subject subject matter expertise um, on any emerging technology. And then once we understand kind of what was happening both at, at the industry level, but also what was happening at National Brigham, we would then be able to have more of an informed decision about what to do with that information and how do we support this um, based on what we were seeing on the ground. We based kind of uh, this process on a, um, a very common um, kind of uh, uh, educational uh, um, uh, axiom in medicine called see, one, see, do, teach, right? See one, do one, teach one. I'm sure many of you clinicians out there are familiar with that, that saying. So our first step was C, which was really our diligence pay, phase. And that's where we kind of looked both internally uh, at National Brigham to get a sense of what was already happening in the field of XR. Uh, but also we got a better sense of what was just happening across the whole industry. And as we started looking, particularly internally at MGB, what we saw was pretty astounding. So this is actually updated information. When we first did this about two and a half years ago, uh, we saw over 20 projects across Mass General Brigham in XR already happening. And this wasn't just at Mass General and Brigham, Brigham and Women's, our flagship hospitals. It was actually across our whole system using multiple types of extended reality. So VR, augmented reality, um, uh, uh, and, and, and other kind of kinds of extended reality. And we even saw some core centers. So uh, the AR VR lab at MGH and um, the simulation center at the Brigham, both as really being these core proponents of, of um, uh, this burgeoning field of extended reality. And importantly, um, as we've kind of grown, what we've seen is that number has just continued to grow to, as you saw previously on that previous slide, 50 plus projects and now over $200 million of research. And this was like pretty astounding um, uh, to kind of find uh, two and a half years ago. What was even more astounding with all of this was that um, for the most part, as we learned about these individual projects from different labs and different clinicians, uh, it became very clear that most people had no idea that anyone else within our system was doing anything in extended reality. So when we transitioned to kind of the do phase, once we kind of understood what was happening, one of the things we wanted to do was really um, try and break down some of those silos, create a community uh, for XR at MGB, also kind of acknowledging that, holy heck, there's actually a lot happening in this field and it spread the gamut from both surgical use cases uh, like planning um, and, and training to um, uh, kind of the mental health field where uh, uh, folks at MGB were using kind of or and are using XR to help with um, uh, group therapy um, and, and everything in between. It was pretty incredible. So as we started to build that kind of community, um, uh, we started creating and collating information about the different companies that were already working within uh, the MGB system so we could share that with our community. We started doing an XR club, which is a monthly event within an MGB um, uh, where we we have kind of researchers and collaborators and people interested in the space. They can all convene. It's a work in progress meeting. Um, it's also now evolved to become a visiting professor meeting. And we sometimes even invite kind of industry um, uh, 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 in industry to kind of talk about their solutions as well. We hold this monthly. It's kind of grown throughout the years. And we've even held events in the metaverse. So this was actually, as far as I know, uh, one of the first uh, National Brigham kind of events uh, held inside of um, a, a metaverse space. This was an alt space in December of 2022. Uh, rest in peace, alt space. Um, we also do a, a journal club. So in the upper left-hand corner, that was a journal club that we held um, with our colleagues at uh, the Center for Innovation in Digital Healthcare at Mass General Hospital um, uh, in the digital health space. And in the bottom right-hand corner, was an example of how we try and have um, uh, uh, the attendees of XR Club demo some of these experiences. So this was with a um, industry um, uh, a vendor uh, who came over and and demoed kind of their solution to uh, to 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 the members of the XR Club, and this has just kind of continued to grow. So um, over the summer, we've actually extended um, this uh, kind of program. Uh, to be a partnership with 
uh, larger kind of entities across Massachusetts. So this event, we partnered with the Massachusetts eHealth Institute, and we invited kind of the head of healthcare for HTC and other kind of um, leaders in the XR space, both at MGH and Boston Children's, to do a, 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 a event that was um, uh, uh, really well received, um, pretty big turnout. Uh, it's been a lot of fun kind of creating this, this community at Mass General Brigham. We actually also create our own kind of solutions as well. So part of our due process is building out solutions. So this is actually a lightweight example of um, using kind of uh, web-based XR to enable a digital twin of the code car at Brigham and Women's. We built this for our nursing colleagues at BWH. And you know you can invoke this using any kind of smartphone. You can scan this card and in your smartphone, you get a 3D representation of our um, code cart, and then you can tap in and see exactly where things are um, uh, inside of this digital code cart. And the nurses and the nurse educators love it because uh, they are able to actually physically see and use kind of that spatial information to understand what's inside of a code cart without actually have to, having to open or break open a code cart for that educational purpose. And now we're in the final stage, which is teach. And that really is kind of presenting some of what we've been doing um, to things like this and, and other, other conferences, um, lectures and talks. But I think ultimately, as we kind of go forward, um, one, of our, one of the big teaching things that we've learned from this, uh, this effort is that this uh, siloing and this burgeoning kind of field um, really benefits from the creation of community. This is what we saw at MGB. Um, and we saw, I saw that this was actually needed uh, for the entire industry as a whole. So about a year ago, um, uh, I started the American Medical Extended Reality Association or AMXRA. And really um, AMXRA is, we're shooting and what we're looking for and doing is becoming the essential 21st century medical society for um, extended reality. So we're an interprofessional, interdisciplinary medical society uh, whose mission is really to advance the science and practice of XR um, through care delivery, scientific investigation, innovation, education, advocacy, and community. We're about a year old. We actually just turned a year uh, this month, and we have over 200, it's actually 270 members. Since, since I submitted these slides, we, we continue to grow every day. We, um, our members are physicians, nurses, psychologists, scientists, developers, entrepreneurs, students, technologists. They represent um, some of the finest institutes across the United States uh, the, the, the world, um, uh, but also industry and um, uh, the, uh, the government. And uh, we really are trying to kind of move forward uh, this field of extended reality and you know our history we really are about a year old we're a nonprofit that was started in august in january we actually um uh, uh opened up our space inside of a, a metaverse we actually have a couple now uh but in january 1st we opened up our amxra space in meta horizon worlds we do meet and greets every tuesday 7 uh, p.m eastern standard time uh, and horizon worlds if you just search amxra you can find our space and um uh, in January, at the end of January, we started doing a podcast series called AMXRA Member Q&A. We're up to six episodes. They get released uh, semi-regularly, and the goal is to kind of highlight members and break down silos. And in February, we obtained our 501c3 pros, uh, status. And in March, we really kind of um, had many of our first major announcements about the society. And by May, we actually had... Um, uh, onboarded our 200th founding member. Um, and we have three main core initiatives at AMXRA. The first is to be the professional home for MXR. And really we're doing that by creating the community um, through our platform. And also eventually we aim to do everything a professional society would do um, uh, for a field. So acknowledge leaders, um, uh, award them, create new opportunities through job postings and uh, create new training and cert certification opportunities for members. Uh, we are advancing the education 
of medical extended reality. So this is actually an example of a um, uh, event that we uh, kind of sponsored in Meta Horizon Worlds, which was a live um, kind of a talk open to the public about addiction medicine. And uh, this is actually a, a live stage uh, with an animated nucleus accumbens and the dopamine was flying in. And what was great is when, as the addictionologist was speaking, um, he was able to press a button and then all of a sudden all this dopamine kind of flew out and it represented what the addicted kind of um, addiction does inside of the brain. It was, it was pretty, pretty incredible. We're also working with professional societies like the American Medical Association and others um, to educate professional societies and our colleagues. And we also aim to work with groups like the FDA uh, on creating standards and guidelines for this burgeoning field. Um, as we kind of go, the last kind of core initiative that we're trying to move forward is really the science of medical extended reality. And um, we've actually made some pretty incredible strides uh, being a one year old society. So I'm pleased to say that actually last week we formalized a relationship with um, Marianne Liebert, Liebert Publishers, um, uh, to create the very first open access peer reviewed journal dedicated to medical extended reality. Uh, it's the Journal of Medical Extended Reality or JMXR. Um, and actually, a couple days ago, we had our inaugural meeting of the JMXR editorial board. We are super thrilled. We think this is going to be um, a huge kind of um, contributor to solidifying this field. Dr. Brennan Spiegel over at Cedar sinai a very well-recognized leader uh, in um, uh, XR, uh, is the editor-in-chief. This is the editorial board um, coming from all parts of uh, 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 multiple disciplines, um, all parts of the United States, uh, and um, we are thrilled to be able to contribute to this. So I will just end by saying that, uh, you know, as I start, I started by saying I'm a clinical informaticist. Um, uh, there's a very common uh, saying in clinical informatics, which is Friedman's fundamental theorem of biomedical informatics, which is the computer plus clinician is greater than clinician alone. And I would just say the updated one for the 21st century, uh, I think, has to look at these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and extended reality. And really, um, uh, the value of um, clinical medicine and kind of how we practice in the 21st century, I think, will be this updated fundamental theorem, which is uh, emerging technologies like AI plus XR plus uh, the clinician will be better than the computer and clinician alone. So with that, um, if I would encourage you all, if you're interested, to please reach out. Uh, consider joining AMXRA. We have a student and learner uh, a, a, a discount as well. And you can reach me at mark at amxra.org. And I think we're going to have a pretty um, uh, 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 exciting kind of um, uh, next few talks to actually talk about some examples of how extended reality can be applied in medicine. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. And again, if you have any questions for Dr. Zhang or as we go forward, feel free to add them in the Q&A chat. Um, and now we're going to move into the practical applications and case studies. So I'll turn it over to Frank um, from BioDigital Inc. to speak to that. Great. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, Laura and the AMA so kindly invited me here to primarily show you real world examples of extended reality and some of the results we're seeing. Uh, but first, I thought I'd start by just providing a little context around immersive and the results we've seen on, you know, using immersive on 2D displays outside of extended reality. So you can contrast and compare a little bit. Um, Dr. Zhang did a great job explaining some of the basics, but just to reiterate, uh, the way we look at immersive is simply deep absorption in something. And that could be a real environment or like we're talking about today, an artificial or virtual environment. Now, extended reality expands on that by also including your environment. So as you saw in some of Dr. Zhang's slides, uh, the environment can be closed off from the real world, like in virtual reality, or the holograms could be overlaid on the real world, like in augmented reality. So um, 
in order to show you those real world applications, ideally we'd send you all a headset. But since that's not possible, we did our best to, to capture some video snippets from within the headset that I'll show you momentarily. But before doing that, just a little, again, a little context on immersive. Um, we started the, our platform company 10 years ago with the vision that interactive 3D anatomy, immersive content would transform the way we understand complex medicine. And in order to truly unlock that potential, it had to be accessible, access, easily accessible on a global scale and comprehensive. So not only anatomy, but also how does the body function abnormally and how you treatment. So this big ambitious uh, undertaking to map the entire human body uh, is now nine years in the works, but we've made a lot of progress. If you wanna grab that URL at the bottom, you're welcome to browse some of these 3D models on your own. You just need to copy that right into a, a web browser. Now, our organization focuses, as I mentioned, primarily on education. And uh, we do student education, we do professional education, and more recently, uh, a lot of great use cases in patient education have surfaced. There are other fantastic organizations that use virtual extended reality, immersive content in a range of ways, including, you know, Mark mentioned, uh, Dr. Zhang mentioned uh, mental health, you also see it used in pain management uh, and even surgical planning now. So lots of potential in different areas. We are focused on education primarily. Um, and I, not enough time to go through all the different applications, but one we're especially excited about is pretty simple. You know, with the prevalence now of devices at all touch points in clinical workflows, we're seeing pretty rapid adoption of this immersive content at the point of care where clinicians use it to improve communication of complex conditions and treatments with patients. They can even personalize it for the particular patient case. And um, early results show that it not only saves the clinician time, but also improves understanding and empowers patients to make more informed decisions. That work is actually currently being validated in patient education and patient experience by organizations like Johns Hopkins and Memorial Sloan Kettering. So um, those results we hope to see uh, validated in the next, I'd say six to 12 months. But there's lots of studies out there now on the efficacy in student and professional facing education. Uh, as two examples, the study on the left published in the Annals of Anatomy, uh, a medical school in Europe had half their students use cadavers and half their students use virtual anatomy. And the results showed that the students who used virtual anatomy actually performed 16% better on their exams than the cadavers. Uh, the study on the right, a long-term study on surgical simulation. So again, this is immersive content used on 2D displays right now, not in virtual reality with the headsets yet. Uh, but even with that, they saw that the vast majority of surgeons in training preferred to use this learning modality over some of the more traditional approaches. So now moving on to the video snippets to give you a sense of what happens in virtual reality. Uh, the video you're about to see, we attempted to parse together three snippets. The first are uh, mostly, it's mostly targeted at medical students to learn anatomy. Uh, the second by a major medical device company on heart training. And the key thing to focus in on there is the multiple users in that real time environment. Uh, the expert instructor educating the novices on that heart anatomy. And then the third, which we're really excited about, which is sort of hot off the shelf <clears throat> is a surgical environment. So an expert, again, instructing in real time novices on, in this case, a pediatric procedure. So again, this is the anatomy application for uh, med students. The first thing you see is the different ways you can interact with these 3D objects uh, using controllers or one we're really excited about, which is hand gestures. These devices have gotten good enough where they can, without gloves or anything, 
they can pick up, you know, in a, in a very specific way, the motion of your hand. So it's a very natural interface to, uh, to work with this immersive content. And then, um, you, you know, if you're going to spend extended amounts of time in that environment, you can also do things like configure it. So not only the positioning of, in this case, the body, but also the, all the tools you would use to manipulate that body. And then finally, of course, you know, we're doing our best to emulate what happens in the physical environment, in the real world, things that people are used to, like in the cadaver lab, where you can dissect the body or you can label it, you can describe it, uh, you can run assessments on it. All of that is now possible in this virtual environment. So the next snippet, uh, just to get ahead of it, that's about to start, I think takes the experience to the next level uh, used by a major medical device company on heart education. And now you can even hear the heart beating but if I were to pause it, you see that blue head and those blue hands. So, you know, that's the avatar of the instructor. And you can't see the other attendees, but they're also in there. And they're being guided through the anatomy by that expert. You can scale the anatomy to see things that you can't see in real life. And then finally, this next snippet, which I'd like you to hear, because now you'll be able to hear those different people in the environment, the expert and the novice, communicating in real time. She just went over underwent the cutting patient. procedure. She's got a spike in her heart rate. It went back down, spiking again. But basically, she's still doing well. She's in a happy place. Um, you can see her chest is rising and falling. So she does have some airway that's still moving and acting appropriately. Um, you can actually hear her if you put your head to the patient's chest you can hear her breathe and that is an actual recording of a six month old breathing um but one thing you notice is you do have your time kind of going down so you know something's up here and now we start to see those o2 levels dip into our 80s now it's in the 80s she's still doing okay and your heart rate here okay once your once your o2 starts to dip here as you can see we're getting slowly slower and slower you start to realize something's going on with the airway and yep so you can see the bag squeezing but, you, but you'll notice the patient's chest did not rise while you were doing that that indicates no air is traveling down the airway you're still dropping on your o2 so you have to proceed to the next step you've only got about 10 seconds okay left. which sorry this side right? right correct you're on the oh. right side of it this is uh. <laughs> so do you feel stressed Ann? yes that's the point yeah. so, so the, the the stress that you're you know uh, alex or my my uh, one of my research fellows was sitting next to me and she was she's a medical student at nyu and she was saying as 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 Anne was going through this exercise, she goes, I'm feeling stress like she was she was whispering to me like this is stressful you know and it wasn't stressful because it was stressful because she was under she was uh feeling what i feel which is like okay in a scenario in this kind of scenario you know you're 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 it's triggering certain things and uh the, the medical people will definitely feel stress on this and in a positive way you know in in, in, in a way that, that in a safe space or whatever feel stress in a safe space which is what we want okay so at the end there um that was dr flores a craniofacial surgeon at NYU, uh, who was very active uh, in advising on the development of that simulation. And as you can see on the screen here now, um, that work is sponsored by the Smile Train Foundation that just does incredible work, uh, working to eradicate cleft lip and palate uh, problems globally, uh, have used immersive simulation for over a decade on web and mobile, and now moving a lot of this material into virtual reality with the expectation that learning outcomes and therefore health outcomes will improve. Uh, the chart that you see now will be published in the journal, uh, soon to be published in the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, again led by Dr. Flores, 
And as you can see from those middle two graphs, even in a short time in that environment, uh, understanding of airway management and techniques goes up significantly. So a lot of promise here, and we're gonna continue to, to work through more of these e efficacy studies in collaboration with our partners. All right, so in closing, um, some of the things you know we're really excited about, uh, breaking down socioeconomic and physical barriers to access, I mean, really being able to democratize access to very, very important health information. And, you know, it's our belief that the more immersive, the more interaction and engagement, again, the better the learning outcomes and therefore the better the health outcomes. Now, we think when we say better, you know, when it comes to considerations and risks, uh, that better should be significant. It, in our opinion, it, it has to be significant to overcome perhaps some of the hurdles going from, you know, 2D displays to using these headsets, some people's comfort with wearing the headset being secluded from the real world, or the logistics of accessing and deploying headsets. So more to come on that, a lot of research being done in this field as Dr. Zhang mentioned. And um, again, we're just uh, very excited about the potential and where this will go over the next three to four years. Thank you, Frank. That was great. Um, and now for kind of our final portion here on the practical applications, we have Dr. Nam Jim Jin Kim. Um, I'll pass it to you to kind of speak about your work um, at Albert Einstein. Thank you so much, Lara. Uh, so to start with some context, uh, I'm a robotic surgeon and as a background, I, I'm a general surgeon. Uh, and I get this a lot. We are not the same system, uh, Albert Einstein system in, in New York, the Montefiore group. We are a non-for-profit uh, health system here. Uh, uh, here in Brazil, uh, our health system was, uh, was founded by Brazilian Jewish community back in 1955. And our network cross, uh, runs across through several straight, uh, states in Brazil. And our main hub here is based in Sao Paulo. So uh, for, who, for those who are new to our health system, we are uh, number one uh, health system rank uh, uh, by Newsweek in Latin America. Uh, we do have six hospitals. Three of them are public hospital. Three of them are pub, uh, private hospital, more than 1,300 beds. We, we do perform uh, more than uh, 40 thousand surgeries a year and we have nine teaching units with medical school dental school uh, nursing school biomedical engineering school healthcare administration and other uh, health science uh, degree courses here and uh, in 2019 we shifted our strategy and uh, we became the first uh, intuitive surgical official, official training center here in Brazil. Uh, back back in 2019, that all the training uh, was performed in Bogota, in Colombia. Uh, and since then, we trained more than uh, 1,300 surgeons. 2000 from since 2020, uh, we did we performed more than 2,000 surgeries, robotic surgeries in uh, last year. This year, we're gonna reach uh, around 3,000 surgeries. Uh, we have more than 10 DaVinci platforms and 19 robotic simulators, and we are the first Latin American institution to receive the DaVinci Research Kit. Uh, this program is an open code uh, research program uh, granted by Intuitive Foundation and led by Hawking. So in robotic surgery field, we have a very robust training program. We do have this one year long Postgraduate medical education program is a certification certificate program. So uh, around sixty percent of all these thirteen hundred surgeons, uh, they belong to this one year long program. Uh, we do have also equivalency program for our medical residency and fellow programs, and our medical school and biomedical engineering school students, they get to have their elective courses in robotic surgery in our program as well. 
So if you can imagine if we tra train around 1,300 surgeons uh, since for, for, for the last three years, we do have a lot of OR case observation challenges. So I'm, I'm really happy to be the last one to talk uh, right after this amazing specialist. So bringing this, all these cases. And so we do have a very clear, clear role uh, in, uh, for XR in medical education and especially in surgical training. So basically the way we still do case observation is the way we used to do back in uh, 1800 something. So uh, it is really hard. Uh, there are so many uh, hard time to uh, deal with all the students and all these case scheduling. So the, the problem is that in a very crowded surgery setting, uh, overloaded with many uh, different observers, what are they really learning, right? So we have, we do have sometimes residents, fellows, specialists, and even medical students at the same time. So uh, the, the rooms are gets really crowded. We have very hard time to schedule, even though we have around 3,000 robotic cases a year, it is really hard to, to schedule all these surgeries in a proper manner to fit the specialties and the cases. So they don't get to see different specialty cases and, and uh, at the same time. All the learning is really passive and, and there are no interaction uh, and, and no metrics, right? The, all the learnings are very subjective. Uh, and we are not talking uh, about all the surgical safety issues and even long distance travel costs. So from around this, uh, from these 1300 medic, uh, surgeons, already uh, board certified surgeons, around 15%, they are international surgeons. They come all across Latin America, even from India, Pakistan, and many other countries. Uh, so, uh, and our biggest crew, uh, they come from Mexico. So they have very long distance traveling costs, uh, very high uh, traveling costs. So we, this is a, a real pain point to us and, and we tried everything. We tried uh, like streaming live, uh, but streaming live, we don't have replay. So you don't, you cannot just go back to the, the point you want to ask. So many uh, surgeons watching at the same time. So like they don't have time to interact. The surgeon can answer, but not all the questions. And we tried non-edited video sessions, edited video sessions, putting all the students in a separate room and streaming live. So we tried everything, but uh, it is really hard to come up with some metrics and bring interaction and make this session uh, rich and, and, and worth it for uh, the, all the surgeons traveling so far to watch and learn for robotic surgery. So we are dealing with case observation, right? We are not, we are not talking uh, from other parts. So, uh, what we did, we moved to uh, to take everything to the metaverse. So our project is to transport our OR to the metaverse and provide them uh, a very interactive and immersive experience and put some adaptive learning pathways. So, so since we have we do have different uh, level of learn, uh, background uh, interacting at the same procedure. We put some adaptive learning pathways so different person can move from the point A to the point B within different steps, right? So, and then we could use uh, all the all the interactions uh, from all these virtual uh, reality surgical events, and even you can share events and ask for telementoring. Uh, so, this is a glimpse of our uh, of our prototype. So it is a it is a platform. So you can see all the surgeries. Uh, you can create events for open event for uh, a multiplayer event. You could go for a private event and and bring uh, all your team together. You could go for solo play. So you could uh, pursue uh, on demand adaptive learning pathway on a specific surgery you want to watch. So. Uh, this is a, a MVP we're developing. So 
uh, you could schedule and share the session with all the team and uh, request uh, a specific uh, surgeons who perform and recorded all this session to join and be the moderator and, and join the table uh, and, and, and help to teach all these points. So uh, this is a very short video I'm going to show and this is my last slide. You know, listening to all of these presentations, there's clearly so many benefits, you know, whether it's access, the cost, convenience, or for some, it sounds like this is a preferred um, mode to learning for them. Um, are you seeing kind of across the industry, has this been a slow uptick? Or are you seeing just like a lot of growing demand for um, extended reality? <clears throat> and this can be to anybody. <laughs> um, I'm happy to, to start. Uh, we, we absolutely see a lot of curiosity. And I think, you know, years ago, you saw headsets being deployed at lots of trade shows. There was a bit of a, a hype cycle. I think the hype cycle's behind us. There's a lot of pragmatic use now, practical use. And as we showed a lot of, you know, that the value, the real proven value is surfacing. Uh, but people still want to be educated to make an informed choice, you know, especially in healthcare, which as it should be is, is relatively risk adverse. So massive uptick in curiosity and people looking to make really informed choices on, on how to move forward. I'll just add, you know, I, I think that the, um, uh, what was so astounding when we started kind of exploring this field a couple of years ago was just how kind of useful and, and how, how used this kind of suite of technologies that XR and medical XR really, really kind of encompasses, uh, you know, as, as we've seen kind of even in, in these kind of use cases, the variety of potential uses for kind of all disciplines of medicine, whether it's um, the surgical or procedure heavy uh, kind of uh, fields to medical education and simulation to, you know, I'm a palliative care physician, you know, a lot of folks in kind of in the more um, uh, I would say the art of medicine uh, uh, fields uh, are using extended reality techn technologies or exploring it to augment kind of the ability to have a structured kind of interview or to do kind of leveraging the social VR aspects of the, the technology to enable kind of things like virtual group therapy or um, uh, mentoring sessions. I actually just recently talked with a uh, group that's looking at using kind of VR technology to enable education through kind of guided um, uh, exploration of art pieces from, from museums. And this is for medical education. So I think what we're seeing are the, these like really exciting kind of point solutions for different specialties. And my sense is um, uh, we'll continue to see that grow as some of kind of the kind of choppy waters of any emerging technology, like fundamental things, like, you know, what's the underlying kind of uh, technology stack that will be approved for healthcare? And what's the distribution pathway? And how do you make sure it's safe and reliable? And um, all of these considerations will need to continue to be formalized over the next, I would say, decade or two. Um, uh, uh, but those individual use cases will flourish. And what we're hoping to do with American Medical Extended Reality Association is really create a foundational um, organization that can help kind of move it forward. And I hope to partner with groups like American Medical Association and others to, um, to move that agenda forward. 
Well, I, I guess when everyone uh, hears about metaverse, XR, and everything, the, the, the word comes is like, it's a hype, right? And when everything become, and we do, when we do know the limit of this tool, and we, we in educational part, this is pretty much consolidated. We, 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 we reach the point about the cost. And when you do not have uh, the right trade-offs or you, you are in an institution that value, values education or pillar, uh, it is really hard to move on with these projects, right? So you, need, you do need help from industry, from your institution and have a, to have a good, great project to move on. Uh, so like I'm a surgeon, I need to train other surgeons and they are, it, it is too expensive to do that. And we found uh, a very great tool to do that in a part of this case observation. So, uh, and this is a very uh, tiny initiative in a very huge umbrella. So I guess that this kind of initiative Dr. Zhang is doing, putting everything in, in a huge umbrella is going to help to uh, to consolidate and bring uh, all these projects to reality. We have a couple of questions that came in. Um, let's see here. Um, are there any specific headsets that tend to get used in these medical XR applications? Are they, I guess, maybe specific to the application or is it kind of general? <clears throat> maybe, maybe I can kind of give you a broad answer. Um, you know, I think the first kind of decision tree is, do you use a standalone headset uh, or do you use a you know PC VR headset or a headset tethered to a um, uh, a computer, a laptop or a desktop that actually powers the experience, or uh, do you use a um, a phone that is attached to kind of a you know a kind of Google cardboard or plastic insert um, to enable your kind of XR experience? And some XR experiences, as um, Dr. Dr. Kim kind of laid out, um, may not even need um, a headset to really accomplish. So, so sometimes, you know, you can create um, uh, multi, multi-modal ways of, of experiencing those, those, uh, those uh, experiences. Uh, when you are looking at this standalone devices, so those are like kind of probably the most popular is the MetaQuest line of uh, headsets. It's probably the, the most consumer um uh consumer you know highest consumer um uh sector is meta quest you know we see a lot of solutions i see a lot of solutions that target target the the, the quest as the as the as the platform but certainly there are others and 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 one could say that some of the other kind of players may actually be more um enterprise ready uh than 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 quest so HTC has some um, excellent devices. Uh, there's a, um, a Byte, da- oh, sorry, Pico. Pico has uh, some great devices as well. Um, and, and certainly there are, there are others in the, in the field. I, I can add to that from our experience. So we do a lot of telementoring here. And then for that, we use some, um, some general device like head, head, headset to just a stream and that could be any other uh, platform. Uh, but for uh, fusion, image fusioning, like we do use uh, HoloLens and the HoloLens 2 is actually approved for pre-surgical planning, not for intra-op yet. So that helps a lot to plan all the surgery and we are moving along to some clinical trials to do, uh, we do have hard time to, to sync the, the the heartbeat and the diaphragma movement in a, in a soft tissue surgery. But for uh, orthopedical uh, neuro, uh, neuro, neurosurgery, uh, that works. But it it needs, still needs refinement yet. Let's see. Another question. Um, what is some advice you would give to someone who wants to enter the XR world career-wise? And what skills do you think are necessary for them to develop? I think uh, uh, consider joining the American Medical Extended Reality Association. It's the medical society mm-hmm. for this field, and 
hopefully um, the community will be a, um, a nice starting point to kind of learn more. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think getting involved, you know, joining um, events like this is great. There's some really uh, excellent kind of conferences um, that are early, I would say, but I think just a testament to this field being fairly burgeoning. So I think virtual medicine out at Cedar sinai hosts VMED, uh, VMED 24. It's a, it's a great conference. It's approachable. Uh, you have to get to the West Coast, though. And then I would say um, IVRA, the International VR Healthcare Association, hosts uh, conferences um, uh, as well. Great place to network. Um, I would highly recommend. And there are others as well. Yeah, and I would just add, as part of those experiences that uh, Dr. Zhang, you know, what, what role would you like to play in this burgeoning field? Right? There's lots of different roles that are going to be required to truly drive value from sales to marketing to development to subject matter expertise and so on and so forth. Right? And we find that developing the best uh, solutions requires participation from all of those people uh, to, to truly get it right. Another question, um, interesting one. Um, where is the development or potential for combining generative AI and XR in medicine? A hot topic for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's tr the, the short answer is it's tremendous. Uh, we have some early prototypes already and uh, that, that, that simply shows that the AI is allows us to generate material more specific to the user needs quickly and more cost effectively. So uh, instead of you know, pre-prescribing all the you know, potential pathways through the environment or all the responses uh, to questions perhaps a user would ask, uh, some AI models, uh, especially as we further develop them, can, can do that on the fly. So we do think it'll, you know, overall, it'll, it'll significantly enhance the user experience. I would just say, I mean, I think there's just a lot, you know, just to echo that, there's a lot of opportunity with the intersection of Gen AI and XR. And in many ways, I think of it kind of as two sides of the same coin. I mean, they're eventually going to uh, merge and their fates are pretty much entwined, I would say. A XR is really how we are going to experience the world um, in the next paradigm shift, the next internet. And uh, generative AI is really going to be how we actually create, populate um, the world. So for medicine, you know, not only will it help kind of generating all the assets um, needed for these immersive experiences, uh, but also uh, think about, and uh, there are already companies doing this now, creating kind of um, patient simulations and patient scenarios where instead of coding out each kind of branched dialogue, you're able to use Gen AI to essentially create a scenario and then have a free flowing conversation. That's gonna continue to happen. I think the other thing that is gonna be really, really incredible with the advanced kind of AIs is the ability to do um, uh, you know, surgical, surgical training and simulations where your movements and the, you know, the recording of that encounter can then populate a kind of um, a scorecard or even a, um, a procedural note um, based on just the movements that you're doing. And that, that's something that kind of these technologies will enable. And, and you know, what's even more exciting in my mind is the, the stuff that isn't obvious, right? The second order, thir third order things that will eventually pop up uh, at the intersection of Gen AI and XR that will just wow us um, when it happens. And that, that's what I'm really excited for. I would like to add that uh, it's like more than a, uh, like just like an appeal because I, I'm not sure how you guys are uh, like in, there in US, but here in Brazil, the, uh, the generative AI is like stealing all the attention from all the devs and all these smart guys. And we are having really hard time. We are falling behind the schedule. This original project is to, supposed to go live in November and we are really working hard because this is all about like generative AI right now. And like, nobody wants to work hard on the metaverse. And the point you could combine the two and the, the point you mentioned, Dr. Zhang, this is really important, right? This is how you experience, right? And uh, how you populate everything. And even 
to, uh, I'll, I'll give the name that this is objective performance indicators in the robotic surgery, right? And when you analyze the instrument choreography into uh, and translate that to patient outcome, right? So we need more devs to do that. And I'm really having a hard time here in Brazil, even with the big companies. Well, well, I think I think just to be like, uh, it's great because uh, you know this. Ha I get this question a lot. Like, what about Gen AI? And I think the 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 the, the headline is um, this should not be an either or. It's it's additive, right? Like there are all of these kind of technologies, these emerging technologies, which I think are fundamental and critical for 21st century medicine. They are literally going to define what 21st century medicine is and will become. Um, it's going to be additive. Right, they're they're just these new tools inside of our toolkit, and it's up to us as a um, as professionals, um, a, as clinicians, to help define how we use these. Um, and you know, one is not going to supplant the other. Um, they're they're actually just going to help us stitch together, hopefully, something better than what we have now. And that's that's my hope for both Gen AI and XR. We have time for one more question. Um, and good, there's one question remaining. Um, what do you recommend for startups working in XR health, digital health, attempting to partner with hospitals and clinics? Patients. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let the doctors answer that one. Send them my email. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we, that's one of the things that we do at the at the, um, the iHub. That's kind of one of our core functions. The thing I always try to uh, convey uh, to whether it's a startup or a large company uh, trying to work within uh, our hospital is, you know, especially, you know, everyone in this call, uh, you know, uh, we come from pretty big names, right? Like these named institutions. And that's wonderful. And we have some incredible researchers, incredible clinicians. There's a reason why we're, we have the name. Um, but if that's the reason you're reaching out to us, is that alone? I, I think I think that's when the expectations don't align with, align with the actual reality at the, on the ground. So um, the most important thing is really coming in with a clear agenda of what you want, doing the research to understand who within our institute actually um, would bring a value add to kind of the thing that you're trying to do. Um, and the more specific and the more homework you've done, the better. I, I get so many reach outs from companies who, you know, the ask is, I'd like to talk with your CEO and the chief nursing officer. And like, you know, my response is, I would like to talk with the CEO as well. Um, so like, look, just get in line and we'll, you know, let's, let's, let, let me figure out how I do that first and then we can, we can have a conversation. That's not the right response. The right response is, you know, we're a company focused on X, Y, Z, and you have a world-class research group. Um, and this person specifically, I think, because of this paper or this work they're doing, um, would really add value as either an advisor or uh, we just love to get feedback um, from this person. That's something that I can work with. And I can make that connection and see if there's interest and if there's mutual interest, make the direct connection between the individual and the startup or company. Um, but I would say that's that's a much more fruitful pathway forward. Well, I think you know we're right at the top of the hour. I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining. Um, really, really great presentation. And um, to anyone that's on, uh, this recording will be out in two weeks. This link that you have, it's on demand. So if you want to rewatch it, share it, you're welcome to do that. Um, here's my contact information. And for our director, Stacey Lloyd of Digital Health, if you have any questions or want to reach out about the session, um, and yeah, thank you all. Have a great Thursday.